Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. And we read here, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. For whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. And would you join with me in prayer, please? Father, thank you that we get to come together again this evening to look into your precious word, to lift up our voices in song, and express the praise that's in our hearts for your holy name. Thank you for creating us and creating us in a way that we could have a relationship with you. And making it possible, Lord, when we had spurned that way to be forgiven and come back into a relationship with you through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. Father, help us to be thankful for that tonight, to appreciate it in the depths of our heart. Help us as we look into these verses of Scripture to discern their meaning, but also, Lord, to discern their meaning for us personally. And Lord, what it is that you want to change in our hearts and our lives tonight as we look into your eternal truth. Father, I'm thankful for those that have gathered here. We want to pray for those, Lord, it's a long weekend that have traveled elsewhere, some up to Sandy Cove, some over to Living Waters, others, Lord, just getting away with their families. I pray that you give them safety, pray they'd enjoy time with their families. But Lord, I pray for us here tonight that you just bless us with your presence. Lord, we sang earlier that that we're seeking you. We're seeking your face. Lord, reveal yourself to us tonight in your word. In Christ's name, amen. We are going to try and finish up tonight a message that we started over two weeks ago and uh, coming back to it tonight. And for those of you who are here this morning, you realize we've already gone beyond and had two messages beyond this. Uh, because we did those in the morning, but we're coming back here tonight to this particular passage of Scripture. One of the things we highlighted in those opening verses, three things about us as God's children, it says we're the elect, that is, we're chosen of God. It's a great thing to be chosen. Second thing we saw is that we're holy. The fact that God calls us holy really is referring to this. It's God's putting us through a process of sanctification, and God's goal is to change us into His likeness. So, I like to think of it this way, we're chosen by God and we're being changed by God. Then there's one more thing that he says here, and he says, and beloved. That means we're cherished by God. I can understand us cherishing him, but what an amazing thing, isn't it, that he cherishes us and longs to have a relationship with us and the great joy of knowing him personally as our Lord and our Savior. We've just come through a passage here that talks a lot about things that need to be put out of your life. He he speaks of this way, put off. It's like taking off an old suit of clothes that's all dirty and got mud on it and maybe some manure. You've been out in the barn, whatever. But you, you take that off and then you put on some things. And there's some bad things that need to go out of our lives we need to take off. And then there's other things we need to put on. And among those that he says we need to put on, he lists them here in verse 12. He says, Beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, and bearing with one another. And as we look at those things, tender mercies means to feel what others feel, to care about what's going on in other people's lives, to try to maybe in a little way get inside their heads and, and, and see things as they see things and how they're experiencing things in their lives. Somebody else translated it this way, to smear with inward affections. 
<laughs> to just smear the whole situation. You're in a situation with something. Jeremy and I are having some struggles, and I just want to smear that with what? With, with affections, to, that I deal with them not in anger or harshness or bitterness, but in the love of Christ. That's what he's teaching us, that how we get along together as God's people. Then he says kindness. Kindness has to do with mellowing anything, taking out the harshness of it, not dealing with people in harshness, because he realizes in the church, anytime you get a group of people together and there's differences, and there's always differences, right, because everybody's different, you're setting yourself up for conflict. And outwardly, you can smile and pretend there isn't, but somewhere along the way, you're going to run into conflicts with people. Somebody's going to say something that you don't like. Somebody's going to hurt your feelings. Somebody's not going to do something you think that they should do. And he says, you need to treat those people with kindness. Take the harshness out of it. It's, somebody else translates this, plastering the situation with grace. Applying the grace of God to every situation in life, dealing with others in kindness. Why? Because grace is God dealing with us in kindness, isn't it? That's the way he has treated us, and it's an amazing thing how he's done that. And then he talks here about humility. Humility, we said, is the very opposite of self-love. Another way of putting that, it's the abs absence of self-exaltation. If you've got somebody going around and they're tooting their own horn and blowing their own horn all the time, you know there's no what? There's no humility. True humility is not seeking self-exaltation. It's seeking to exalt others. Putting others first is another way of putting that. Then he talks about meekness, or it can be translated gentleness as well. And when we think of meekness, we think of weakness, but that's not what the word implies. It literally means strength under control. It's a picture of taking a wild stallion and breaking that stallion so you can put a bridle on it, sit on its back, and it didn't lose anything of its power, but it's what is strength under control. And God wants to see Christians with the strength of Christ overcoming the weaknesses of their lives, empowering them to live in a way that blesses other people's lives. Then he talks about long-suffering. Uh, that that I, has the idea of not being easily provoked, not being one of these irritable people that almost looks for a situation to blow up over. That's what he's talking about. We need to be long-suffering. We need to be patient with others, an attitude of acceptance of others. And we put all those under the heading we will accept you as you change. Why? Because Benson back there, he's grown in Christ. I've seen him grow over the time that I've been here. But you know what his wife told me this morning? He's, he's a project that's still under construction. She didn't say that. But I know that because every one of us is still under the construction of God. He's making us into the likeness of his dear son. How many of you realize you are still under construction? God's still working on you. He's still working on me. And because of that, I need to understand that there's going to be situations where if, if, if I'm with Brent Roy every single day of my life, there's going to be some places where we're going to rub each other on, and I'm going to think, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he said that. But I need the acceptance to not expect him to be perfect. And the problem is we forget that truth. And we do expect of others what we don't even expect of ourselves. There's nobody here, I don't think, that would walk up to me at the door tonight and say, I want you to know I'm perfect. You know you still have struggles in your life. You have areas where there are weaknesses, where you battle sin in different areas of your life. And yet somehow we expect everybody else to be perfect. I'm saying that one of the values... One of the virtues, if you will, that we need to adopt as a church and make it a goal of our individual lives, we need to affirm this truth that we will accept you as God changes you. Now, I say that because there are a lot of churches today that are saying, you don't need to change. Just come on in. We'll accept you as you are. Well, we'll accept you as you are, but we're not going to accept the fact of leaving you where you are. God won't do that. God's in the process of saving you to change your life to make you more like his son. And it would be, be a horrible thing if God saved me and left me like I was, wouldn't it? That would be an awful thing, to continue on the pathway of sin and not know the power to overcome sin in my life and see the God of the Word changing me. And so we need these things in our lives, and, and uh, we, need, we need to be willing to accept people 
as they change. Because nobody here has it all together. Nobody has risen to the top of the heap. We're all in the process of being changed and transformed by the living God. What we're talking about in this whole section, I'll just back up a little bit and remind you, is this. We've been talking about a grace-driven church, a church that is driven by God's grace, not purpose-driven, not, not program-driven, not pastor-driven, but driven by the very grace of God. And understand this, the grace of God isn't the grace that says, oh, you're fine just as you are, you keep on with your sinful lifestyle. The grace of God says, I don't want you to have to go through the pain of sin, I'm going to change you. That's the grace of God that I want us to embrace as a church. And a grace-driven church is one where the people understand they've been chosen by God. They understand that they're being changed by God. And they have this assurance. Yes, we're going to fall down, we're going to stumble at times, but we are cherished by God. And if God does that with us, yes or no, we need to do that with one another. Yes or no? Yeah, we need to. So (laughs) how much do you want to bet there's going to come up a situation this week where somebody's going to tick you off? They're going to do something to offend you. And you're going to have to come back and say, okay, what was it the pastor was talking about the other night? How am I going to handle this situation? What am I going to do? And I hope what you'll say is, you know what? I wish they hadn't said it. I wish they hadn't done it. But maybe that's an area where God just hasn't got to the place where he could change that in their life yet. And I'm still going to accept them. I won't, I'm not going to shut them out and say, I'll have no more to do with him. You know that, Brent, I'll never speak to him again. No, what? We're part of the body of Christ. That's what he's talking about. He wants us to stay joined together as a body of God's people and continuing to work together. Second thing I want to say here tonight is this. We will forgive you when you fall. Did you hear that? We will forgive you when you fall. Anybody here have a thought that maybe over this next year you're never going to fall? How many of you think somewhere along the way this year you're going to fall? Somewhere, somehow. We'll fall in our marriage. We'll fall in the way we raise our kids. We'll fall in our workplace. We'll fall. We're going to mess up. We're going to fail God. We're going to fail ourselves. We're going to fail others. And we fall in so many ways. Don't be so arrogant as to think you can't fall. Let him that thinketh he can't fall, what? You better take notice because a fall is coming in your life if you're that arrogant and proud. Now, Verse 13 says, bearing with one another and, and what? Forgiving one another. How many of you in the time you've been in this church have had to forgive somebody? Right? And you're going to have to keep on forgiving people. You're going to have to keep on offering the forgiveness of God to other people. What's it mean to forgive? Literally, forgiveness means Treating another individual as if the offense never occurred. I offend Jeremy. I come and ask him for forgiveness. It means that a couple of weeks from now, I do something else and he doesn't get back. Look, you did this and this and this. You can't do that if you're going to forgive. And, and I want us to be a church where we embrace forgiving people when they fall, when they fail, when they mess up in their lives and releasing them from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. Because every time you injure somebody, you create an obligation between you and them in your lives. I, uh, I don't know how many of you people know this, but uh, Pastor Jeremy has this thing about his car. He washes it like four times a week. He just can't stand if there's a spot of dirt on it anywhere. (laughs) Do you know that his wife and his kids have never been allowed to eat inside his car? Because it's just an abomination to him to have food or anything get inside his car. 
He never let my wife drive his car because every time she drives my car and I go to get it, I find these little pieces of chips all over the steering wheel. You wouldn't put up with that, Jeremy. I, I just know that. And, and you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but it just kind of got to me, and I just couldn't stand walking by that car. I, I was waiting now almost a year to be able to walk by it and just right wash me on the side of it, but I can't because he keeps us thinking things so clean. Sorry if I'm a little bitter about it. Well, I got an idea. I went out in the field back here. There's a bunch of kids the other day back there, and, and they were playing, and they had mud all over them. And I went down to McDonald's, and I bought a bunch of burgers. And I went out, and we got in Jeremy's car, about 16 of them, in his car. And they're eating, and there's ketchup and things all over the place. And We had a great picnic in his back, car, back seat of his car. And then Jeremy found it. And Jeremy was offended. Did he have a right to be offended? Yeah. And because I offended him, I, I kind of felt like I owed him something, right? Because when you offend somebody, it puts you in a place where you owe somebody something. And what's the very least I owe him? Pardon? A <laughs> burger. <laughs> well, cheaper than that's an apology, right? So I'll, I, I'll give him an apology, and maybe I'll, I'll send Mary out to clean the car up for you. <laughs> now, that's a silly illustration, but I just want to bring home a truth to you. When somebody comes to you and they ask you to forgive them, it means you remove the obligation, right? And say, so you, you, don't, you don't need to send your wife over to clean it out. You know, you, I accept your apology. I offer you forgiveness. And you don't any longer owe me anything. That's forgiveness. And if we're going to forgive people, that's where we've got to learn to get in our lives. And it brings... It brings a freedom through forgiveness when we learn that. It sets us free when we forgive, and it sets other people free, right, from their obligation to us. So there's a great freedom when we practice forgiveness. Do you know that oftentimes pastors leave churches because people in the church can't forget them because they made a mistake? How many of you figured out pastors can make mistakes? Other times pastors leave churches because... They won't admit they've made a mistake. And we need both. We need a willingness to seek forgiveness, but we also need a people that will have a heart to do what? To give forgiveness. Realizing everybody is changing. Everybody uh, is going to mess up and fall in some area in their lives. Now listen to this. There are no enduring relationships without forgiveness. No marriage is going to last very long where there's not forgiveness that's willing to be extended because we're going to hurt each other. We're going to say things. We're going to do things. We're going to be inattentive. We're going to do this. None of us is perfect. We're not perfect in our marriages. We're not perfect in the way we raise our kids. Matter of fact, I don't know of any area of my life where I'm perfect, and I need forgiveness all the time. And forgiveness is freeing from obligation. If our vision here is that we're going to do life together as God's people, and we're going to stick together in this thing and work together, it's only going to work if we accept others when they don't measure up to our standard, when, when we continue to forgive people when they what? When they fall. That's got to be extended. And, and, and it doesn't work if, oh, you offended me, so I'm going to run to a church down the street. Well, I guarantee you, if you're there very long, somebody's going to offend you there, and then you'll have to run to another church. The purpose that God's giving us these instructions of forgiveness and acceptance and all this is that he intends us to stay and stick it out and work through these things in our lives. And in this matter of forgiveness, he says here, forgiving one another... If anyone has a complaint against another, 
I'll guarantee you there's somebody here tonight has a complaint against somebody else. That person may not be here, but you have complaints. Maybe some are not here because they've got complaints against somebody. But it says, listen to this, even as Christ forgave you, so you also, what's the next word? Must. Now, I went into that in the Greek and studied that through, trying to find a loophole. And I'm sorry, but I couldn't find any there. You have an obligation before God. You must what? Forgive. You must forgive. If you're going to continue on in your relationship with the Lord and grow in Christ, very often I'll find when somebody comes to me and says, well, Pastor, I'm just not growing in my life, and you talk with them for a while, it'll come down. They've got some grudge, some bitterness nursed in their heart, and it has stopped them from moving forward spiritually in their lives. And you need to ask God for the grace to do what? To forgive others. When they fail you, when they fall, when they mess up, when they hurt because if we stay together for another year or another two years or three years or ten years, whatever it is, it's going to require several major forgivenesses and hundreds of minor forgivenesses that we must extend towards one another within the body of Christ. And it's something that you simply must do. So also, you must do. Forgiving one another. He says, you have trouble doing that. This is what you need to do. Find a cross somewhere. we got one here for you tonight. <laughs> and go stand under that cross and remember how Christ forgave you in that while we were yet sinners. What did Christ do? He forgave you. He forgave those that drove the nails into his hands and dropped that cross with his body on it into that hole in the ground with a jar. He forgave. So also what? Must you. That's an obligation that God has laid upon our hearts. If you remember a story in the Bible of a king who had a servant that owed him hundreds of thousands of dollars, debt that he could never pay. And he comes before that king and falls down and says, Oh, king, forgive me and I'll pay you back. And the king knew he couldn't forgive him, couldn't couldn't ever pay it back. And so he said, I forgive you. Not going to throw you in jail. I forgive you. And then you remember what that servant did? He went out and he found a guy that owed him $10. (laughs) And he had him what? Thrown into prison. There's not a long time takes place, but the king hears about it. And do you remember what the king did? He sent his servants and got that servant that had been forgiven, and he cast him into the prison and said, I am giving you over to the what? Remember the word? I give you to the tormentors. The tormentors. Now, the king in that story is Jesus. The people have been forgiven hundreds of thousands of dollars as you and I, multitudes of sins. And if we can't find it in our heart to forgive others that have wronged us, what we do is we give ourselves over to the tormentors. Who are the tormentors? That would be the devil and his hordes of demons to torment us. They, they find a weakness in us that they can get at and, and eat away at and build up bitterness and other things in our hearts and our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be thrown to the tormentors. I don't want to see any of you thrown to the tormentors. I don't want you to be given over to Satan to work in your life. We need to be a forgiving people, a loving people, a forbearing people. We need to accept people as they change. We need to forgive people when they fall. Third thing I want to say to you tonight, we need to love people no matter what. We need to love people no matter what. I love what he says here, verse 14, but above all these. What's that mean, above? What's it mean? It means of utmost importance. He said, the things I've said are important, but this one is at the top of the pile. This is the peak of the pyramid. 
Above all, all, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Put on love. If you're going to get dressed in the morning, one of the things you ought to put on is this suit of love, if you will. It's the bond of perfection. And he reminds me of Jesus in John 13. He says, a new commandment give I unto you. What's that new commandment? That ye love one another. God calls us in this church as a part of this body called Devon Park Baptist Church to love one another. Jesus said, the way that people are going to know that you're Christians, that you're my followers, is if you love one another. It's absolutely vital. It's the crowning virtue, if you will. If you look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's the crowning fruit of the Spirit. It's the very beginning and root and foundation of all the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Then joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and so on. But it's, it's love that's the foundation of all of this. And what he tells us here, and we've seen it in 1 John in our study in that book, that if a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he says he lies, he's a liar, and the truth is what? It is not in him. You're fooling yourself. Tonight, if you sit here and there are people that are members of this church that you've joined together with, made a commitment to, that you don't love. That includes your wife. That includes your children. That includes your husband. That includes the Sunday school superintendent. That includes the deacons. I know they're hard, but, but the Bible says you've got to love them. And if you can think of somebody tonight that you don't love, you need to get on your knees before God and say, God, would you change my heart? Would you give me the love that I need? 1 John 2, 9 says this, He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. You know what that means? If you don't love your brother, you've got a cause for stumbling. You've got something in your life that's going to cause you to stumble continually and mess up and fall in your life because simply you're not loving your brother as you ought to love your brother. You're allowing your sin to blind your eyes and keep you in the darkness. Don't tell me tonight that you're a follower of Jesus Christ if you've got hatred in your heart towards some saint in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, these abide, what? Faith, hope, and love. And then what's it say? And the greatest of these is love. It's the pinnacle. It's the height, the top of the heap, if you will, that we need in our lives. Now, I get in my email box between three and 400 emails every week. And I'm guessing probably 10 to 15 of those every single week is... You must, you've got to attend this conference, Pastor Woodcock. You've got to go there and learn the secret of growing a great church. And we've got a program for you. That we've got a system that you need to pick up and you need to, to get invested in and, and, and bring into your church. You need our strategy if you're going to succeed. I'm not against having systems and strategies. I think they're helpful, but I'm not going to put my weight on those things. But I'll put it on God's Word, and I'll put it on this thing alone. If this is going to be a great church, we've got to learn to love people. And when I say that, I also want to say this. About a, about a year, maybe it was two years ago, I lose track of time. But I remember somebody had come to our church, and they'd been here for a few weeks, and they came up to me and said this. They said, we're so glad we found your church. They said two things. One, we've learned more Bible in the few weeks that we've been here than we learned in our previous 12 years of the church that they were attending. And then they said this. We have experienced more love in the few weeks that we've been here than we did in the 12 years of the church we were attending. But don't pat ourselves on the back. We've got some work to do yet, don't we? We've got a ways to go in loving people, caring about people, 
the strategy we need, apart from all the good programs and everything else that we have, is we just got to really make an emphasis on loving people. I remember a preacher that was on TV years and years ago. I was a teenager. So you know that's at least 20 years ago. And I would go over to my grandmother's house, and she would watch this program every week. The guy's name was Rex Humbard. Anybody remember Rex Humbard? Do you remember what he always said? Somewhere in the program, I don't remember now whether it was at the end or not, but it was this. You are what? You are loved. You are loved. And I don't know why, but I like to hear that. It, it brought something into my heart and my spirit. You are loved. I want us to be the kind of church that when people come in here, any given Sunday, even if it's the only Sunday they'll ever walk through our doors, I want them to sense this, we love people here. And if we'll do that, we'll do that, we can fill this place on a, on a Sunday night. We might have to build on in order to get all the people in, because I want to tell you, there's a lot of people out there that just wish somebody would love them, that somebody would care a little bit about them. Somebody would be interested in their hurts and all the things that are going on in their lives and the difficulties that they're facing. I want to ask you, Who would have known, if you're here this morning, who would have known, who would have walked out of this church feeling they were loved because of you? Did you let anybody know that? You don't have to say, I love you, but just, hey, we're really glad to have you here. And, you know, what's your name and, and, and where are you from? What led you here? And, and I carry on a conversation with them to show some interest in their lives. Yes? We need to do that with people. We need to get a whole lot better at doing this and making people know that they're loved by God and they're loved by us. I want to jump on to the fourth thing here. In verse 15, he says this. He says, and let. The word let there means allow. Permit it to happen. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, one of the things that means is whatever the situation you're going in in life, maybe some difficult things, some tough things. I was talking with, a, as I said this morning, with a, a, a lady whose, whose daughter has run away from home with a boyfriend and it's breaking her heart. And, and we talked about this, that in these moments, it's so important that we let the peace of God rule in our hearts. The peace that when Jesus was getting ready to go on the cross says, my peace I give unto you. It's a peace like any, unlike any other peace in the world that he alone can give to us. Now, before you can have that peace, you've got to have made your peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got to have come to him and found forgiveness through the blood and be his child. And then you, you can begin to experience that peace of God in your heart and life as you go through difficulties. It doesn't mean you won't face difficulties. It doesn't mean you won't ever feel hurt and all the other feelings that come with things that happen in our lives. But there's a deep-seated peace that says this. God's still God. He's still on his throne. He's still working in my life. And whatever I'm facing, if God's at work, let me ask you a question. Is he half at work? Or is he always doing his best? He is always doing his best for you as his child. And you need that deep-seated thing deep down in. Now, some people take this and say, oh, Christians ought to be, you know, these people that nothing moves us. We never, never get upset. Listen, Jesus got upset with some things. He upset the tables of the money changers. And at Lazarus' tomb, when he got there, he wept, right, over Lazarus is dead and, and all. The, yeah. That's, that's normal. That's a part of life. So he's not talking about being a stoic. He's not talking like uh, being uh, a Star Trek character, uh, Spock, you know, Vulcan. 
No, no emotions. He's, he's not saying that Christians are going to be like that when they have the peace of God. But we know deep down that I'm going to get through this, that my God will see me through because he's at work. And he's always doing his best for me. And sometimes I need those difficult things in my life because we grow through those things, don't we? As we experience them, as we, we face those difficulties in our lives. And do you know what he says here about the peace of God? He said, let it happen. Allow that peace to come in and flood you. Instead of flying off the handle and going to pieces, get alone with God. Spend some time in his word. Spend some time in prayer and let the peace of God, what? Come and settle in your heart as you deal with these difficulties of life. Let it happen. But it's more than that. It's more than that. There's the, the idea here as I, I think about this peace of God that we talk about, the peace that Christ had, the peace that he offers to us. He's thinking of this. Look at the context here, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in what? One body. So what he's talking about, that this peace is to somehow affect the way that we live together as a body, right? That's the context. And in that body, where it's got many members, there's times where that body's going to be in conflict with itself. I was watching a baseball pitcher the other day, and he didn't do very well, and he walked off the field, and he up and smashes himself like that twice in the face. I might want to smash something, but it ain't going to be my face. It's already had enough damage done to it. But what he's saying here is that we need to let the peace of God rule in our hearts when there's conflict comes up. And our first thought is get on the phone and call somebody. And then, uh, just a minute now. Let the peace of God settle in here. Can I really have peace in my heart and begin to gossip and spread rumors and all those types of things? Is that the peace of God ruling in my heart? No. It's to rule. Literally, the word rule there means to umpire. <laughs> it makes a decision. No, that's a, that's a ball. This is a strike. That's a ball. This is a strike. That's a ball. That's outside the will of God. This is a strike. This is what God would have me to do in this situation in my life. That's the peace of God ruling in your heart, showing you what to do and how to respond to different people and different situations so that what? So that the peace of God not only reigns in you in a pers as a personal thing, but it reigns in the whole body of Christ as we embrace one another this way and we care about one another and we let the peace of God reign in our hearts. Then look what it says here, <clears throat> and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called, what's the next phrase? And be thankful. Now let me just say this. One of the key things, I think what he's saying here, that will rob you of the peace of God in your heart is being unthankful. Of thinking, that's not fair. I deserve more. I deserve better. Walking around with that unthankful attitude will do more to get you upset with people because, oh, oh, my, my grandma died and she didn't call me or he didn't, he didn't send me a card or this didn't happen or that didn't happen. It's living with an ungrateful, unthankful attitude that will rob you of the peace of God in your life. So I want to encourage you. I can't say it too strongly. The importance of the peace of God ruling within you. I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but it says in Romans chapter 1, where it's cataloging that catalog of sins and how man fell away from God, and when they knew God, they didn't recognize him as God. Neither were, what is it? Neither were thankful. How many of you looked at unthankfulness as a sin? Most of the time we don't. But unthankfulness, ungratefulness in our hearts is a sin against God. And whether you think it's a sin or not, it's clear that God does. It's very clear that God does. He says, 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks. To be a thanksgiving people that know the peace of God in their lives. And I, I just came across this 
this afternoon I was, I was reading a, a book, and so I copied this down. It says, when you experience the peace of God, it means the cessation of hostility. When I have peace with God, it's the cessation of hostility between me and God. When I experience the peace of God in my life, it means the cessation of hostility between me and God's people. It's got to stop. Then it told a, an interesting story. It comes from the Salvation Army uh, about a century ago or so. And there was a, a woman that lived in, in this community, and she was known as Warrior Brown. You kind of get some idea of what her character might have been like, right? And I mean, if somebody crossed her, she just was a warrior. She'd grab whatever she could get. She'd beat him with it. She had a fiery temper. She was belligerent. Uh, she drank and became enraged when she got drunk and, and was a real problem until one day came when she heard this salvation band out on the sidewalk and a group of people singing, and she came and she got converted to Christ. And she was one of those ones that was genuinely changed. And a night came after she'd been saved a couple of years. They had her up. She was giving her testimony one night when a man in the crowd cursed her. She just kept going, giving her testimony. And then he threw a large potato and struck her right on the eye. And it started to bleed and swell. And she just very calmly, now, if she hadn't been converted, you know what she'd been doing. But she reached down and picked up the potato and put it in her pocket. That was in the spring. In the fall of the year, <laughs> she showed up at that man's door with a bag of potatoes. She had taken the potato home, cut it into several pieces, buried it in the ground, nurtured it, let it grow, put it in the bag, and took it back to him and offered it to him. That's the peace of God working in our hearts. Taking situations, say, how can I use that not to get back at somebody, but to what? To use this to glorify God because he's changed my heart. He's changed my life and helped me to be all that God wants me to be in my life. The fifth thing, and I'm not going to talk about this, just mention it for you. It says that we need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. I want that to be something we value as a church. The word to dwell in means literally to be at home, literally at home in our hearts. It means that we're allowing the word of God to influence how we live our lives, how we react to situations, how we respond to people. We're going to let the word of God dictate the peace in our hearts and what we should do, what we shouldn't do in those moments of our lives. If I could give one thing to this church tonight, it would be this, that you would get a growing passion to let the Word of God dwell in your heart, to be at home in you. Listen, that will never happen if you're not reading it, if you're not studying it, if you're not meditating upon the Scriptures, if you're not memorizing it. That's not going to happen. Coming and listening to me preach is not going to cause that to happen. What I'm talking about of letting the Word of Christ dwell in your heart let me, let me just say this. I don't want the times when you come and I preach or Micah preaches or Jeremy preaches or a visitor preaches to be the high point of your time in God's Word. I can tell you this. The high point of, for me is those times where I sit down. I'm not trying to prepare a message. I'm just sitting and reading God's Word and soaking it in and asking God to open my mind to understand it. And, you know, I may look up in a dictionary some words or whatever, but those times, and I want that for you, and this will not be a great church until we get a whole whack of people that become passionate about the Word of God in their lives. And allowing that word to influence the changes that God is making in their lives. Following after God's precious, holy word. It's past seven. We're going to close for a word of prayer. And uh, let's just bow in prayer, shall we? Brent Roy, would you be pleased to uh, close in prayer for us tonight, please?